<laughs> so, back in the 1980s, a um, gentleman to my right got started, re you know, he had been reading comics pretty much in utero and started writing comics journalism for Amazing Heroes for Fantagraphics and went on, went on to other fame and fortune. And because I was an assistant editor at PC during this period, we would be, you know, he would interview me for one article or another. But somehow always managed to call the house when I wasn't there. So I actually spent more time talking to my wife than me. <laughs> uh, until DC Comics hired him and then we shared an office for a brief period of time. It was wonderful. Yeah. And we've maintained um, this relationship ever since, which is, you know. Call it a friendship. It's okay to call it a friendship. It's a friendship. It's a friendship. Yeah. You know, I, I get a discount for paying the item. <laughs> so, Mark, I mean, you know, the leap from reader to journalist. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, it was, I, I never had any ambition of being a writer, uh, sort of fiction writer, anyway. Mm -hmm. I knew I could put words together. So I'd worked on college newspapers and, and stuff like that. but. I knew that I could do amazing heroes level journalism, fancy journalism. Right. Um, and because there weren't many people doing that, it was a pretty wide open field. Uh, and right. I was, since I was good at it, I got, you know, first people to do anything in fan graphics, and we were doing our preview specials at that time. Mm -hmm. And that was that was really the key, is I was interviewing every writer, every artist out there about their books, and between that and being the guy at conventions who would take you from the airport to the show and get to get to be there, I got to connect with a whole bunch of people. So <laughs> by the time an opportunity came up to be an editor, I, I met most of these people. I spent time with Dick Giordano, I spent time with some other people, all. Mm -hmm. And before we joined staff, yeah. there, there was Comic Cross Week, yeah. which, which is this blip that no one remembers the <laughs> extra, I know. Yeah. But but it gave us Sydney Mellon, and we should talk about Sydney. I, Sydney was great. It was what he's talking about. It. We at some point right before I joined editorial at DC, I had the genius idea of doing a weekly comic book fancy. It was a terrible idea, but it seemed like a good idea. And the thing that killed me was we decided, you know, most magazines are this size. Let's make it like giant. Let's make it huge. You can pitch a tent under that thing. Um, if we give it to homeless people live under and uh, it it didn't it didn't do well um, but in that I had conscripted a friend of mine to do a column at that point Joe who knows Joe Bob Riggs from the name Joe mm -hmm. Bob Riggs uh, satir he was doing satirical columns for Dallas newspapers at the time about you know being a redneck reviewer of movies and so I wanted somebody to write a column that was a fanboy's view uh, like a hardcore fanboy's view of comics and do reviews that way. And we managed to find somebody and then uh, we needed a picture and so I went to my junior high school yearbook and so that's me in those pictures as Sidney Mellon. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was the lasting thing of comics. We, we yeah, because Sidney went, went on for a couple of years elsewhere. I brought him to, uh, to Amazing Heroes when yeah. I was there, yeah. And you know, according to your website you said that even though Comics Week lasted five weeks, yeah. um, it caught Jeanette Khan's eye, yeah. who invited you to interview for what became Born Out of Press. Yeah. Did you have any idea what an indie line of comics was going to be like? I mean, what did, oh, what did you picture? It was awful. <laughs> it was horrific. It was one of the, I, that hour seared into my brain because here's the thing Jeanette's not the one who called me, and I did the interview with Jeanette and Paul, right. but they're not the ones who called me in. It was Dick who called me in, did you not? And because of the nature of the job, they were trying to set up in, within DC a new indie imprint, which became Piranha Press eventually. But they didn't have any idea what it was at this point. So they were reaching out to uh, people in comics journalism, they were reaching out to indie creators, and they couldn't tell anybody what it was that they were looking for until you sat in the room. So I came in that interview having no earthly idea what the job was, but for some reason, Paul and Jeanette thought I knew. So it was the most awkward hour, and you know you love Jeanette, but when I get nervous, I try to make jokes, and nothing, nothing. I will. I remember she asked me early on, because I'm 24 years old. She said, 
what experience do you have entrepreneurial in your existence that show in your life that shows that you know how to build a company from the ground up? And I sat there and like spinning clocks were flying by, and then it just time freezes, and I just said, I sold band candy in high school. Something down, and, and Paul Levis was just sitting there just shaking his head the whole time. So, and I came out of that, and, and again, I didn't know Dick Giordano that well. We weren't friends, we weren't buddies. But I stormed down to his office and to ready to give him a, a just all kind of hell, and he just laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> so, well, he saw something in you because he got hired as you know, an assistant editor. Yeah, a, few, a few weeks later, I got hired as an assistant editor for the main DC line. Yeah, so, so you go from this reader, yeah. To now a creator of comic material. Yeah. yeah well, stepping in on that first day, August 3rd, 1987. Yeah. About 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. What, what, what was going through your mind? First off, I was soaking wet. <laughs> I was soaking wet because I didn't have an umbrella and it poured down rain and I didn't know where to get off in the, in the subway station. So I walked up to 42nd Street uh. and I was soaking wet in my <clears throat> ill fitting father's suit. And, uh, and I sat there for the first three days of the job were spent erasing the pencils for Green Arrow number one. Mm -hmm. That was what I did. I mean, back in, in the time, when everybody was working physically instead of digitally, pencilers would pencil the book and then inkers would ink the book, and then you would have to erase the pencils underneath to make sure they didn't show up in the finished book. Uh, and the, the inkers were supposed to do that themselves, but Dick Giordano was the inker. <laughs> and he had a day job. Exactly. <laughs> he has his privileges, and so for three days, I just sat there and learned how to erase pages. So, who was it at DC then who taught you how to edit a comic book and actually put it together and, and get it out the in three days? Jonathan Peterson was a huge help. Okay. I take it. Jonathan had been there for not very long. Mm -hmm. um, I replaced Greg Wiseman. Right. Who went on to do Gargoyles. Good for him. Young Justice. Uh, yeah. And then um, him and Andy, Andy Helfer to some degree. Mm -hmm. He was, it's hard to get him focused, but yes. Um, you know, you were a big help. You know, everybody was willing to pitch in. I mean, that, the nice thing about the office, it was still relatively small. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. really, and so you could know everybody by name, and everybody was very helpful. Nobody was out to knife anybody in the bag. We were all just trying to get comics out. And during that time, you know, it was a, just a two-year period. I mean, you certainly made a mark with things like your run on Secret Origins and all. I mean, you know, all of a sudden, now you're commissioning these stories and, you know, working with these writers and artists. I know I still had that, you know, gosh wild feel of, oh my god, I'm working with the people I used yeah, to meet. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm working with people who worked at Kurt Swan. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. very intimidating. I'm still intimidated by a lot of those guys. Yeah. But, you know, calling up Walt Simonson or calling up Kevin Nolan or calling mm -hmm. up uh, Mike Kaluta yeah. and asking for a cover is very daunting, but it, it, you know, it, what I had compensated by hiring my friends, I <laughs> compensated by, Looking toward, I, mean, I was always looking for new talent. Mm -hmm. Always looking for new talent and people who had not had a, a voice in comics yet. And some of those guys went on a big thing, and some of them did not. Sure. But I think that the Secret Origins books actually, I think we batted, not a thousand, but I think we batted pretty well. Yeah, it was a really nice creative run all the way through right up until the final issue. Uh, and then, you know, you, you left staff, there was a slight cloud. Yes, no, it's like loud, but it's But immediately okay. bounce back and start freelancing. I get this is what you get for being nice to people while you're on staff. My advice is if you have a job, be nice to everybody because you never know when you're going to need their help. But you started off today by saying you never imagined yourself being a fiction writer. Right. Now here you are writing comic scripts. So how did you make that adjustment? How did you learn to be I, a writer? I edited Secret Origins and I, I worked with every major writer and you know, every A list and B list writer in comics. From Neil Gaiman to you know to Grant Morrison to you know, Danny O'Neill to anybody, all these scripts coming across my desk, and I just absorbed that. I learned more about writing in two years on that job than I could in ten years on my own. So at that point, I thought I, I might be able to do this. I, might. I just I, I was always nervous that you kind of I can come up with more than one idea in your lifetime, <laughs> and then it turns out you can do that. And and how did Marvel reach out to you for your it was before that. They actually, oh, they had, it was Deadpool was the first thing. Okay. They asked, they called me for Deadpool, and I was, yeah, okay, I'll, you know, I'll play. Um, and then I didn't do anything for them for a while, and then Mark Rimmel called. Okay. No, and I'm sorry, it was um, Rob Macchio, who was the editor. And 
he called left a message about doing a Marvel book. Mm -hmm. And I said to my girlfriend at the time, I said, you know, I mean, I, I like DC. In Marvel, I'd only take the job for one character. I'd only do it if it was Captain America. But they're not going to offer me Captain America. Well, they offer me Captain America. And so <laughs> that, was, that was the dream gig. And so that led to some interest in the X office, and that's how I got involved with Age of Apocalypse and Onslaught and stuff like that for a brief period of time before I ran away screaming. <laughs> and, and did you feel yourself grow as a writer? You know, based on the input you got from your artists or your editors? Yeah, I mean, the thing I learned early on was, I learned two things. I mean, the, the, the earlier thing was learning that it's collaborative media. Mm -hmm. It is my story only until such time as I hand it to the artist, at which point it is our story. And I have to be mindful of that and careful of that and respectful of that because something that takes me a day to write can take them a week to draw. And they are staring at the page for a lot longer than I am, so they have a lot more thoughts about my, maybe this should happen instead or maybe this should happen instead. And I always made sure it was an open communication. The other thing I learned, and it took me a while, was that I thought that plots were the most important part of the story. Because mm -hmm. I grew like, you know, with Julie Schwartz. I grew yeah. up with, with these stories that at DC had very little character, but they were always very tight plots, very clever things. And for a long time, I thought that was my goal, is come up with these really clever clockwork plots that fit together like a Swiss watch. And somewhere along the way, I learned, that's crap. That's crap. It's nice to have that, but a plot is not a story. A story is about emotion, a story is about character, a story is about moments where the, the readers feel something. Nobody remembers plot. Everybody remembers Spider-Man lifting the giant machine over his shoulder, but nobody can tell you what happened after that. What happened on the next few pages? Nobody can know. That's what you remember. And that was the hard part to, to, to learn, because again, grew up growing up on the right. stories. So you spend a couple of years writing all of the superheroic stuff, he's doing stuff DC, doing stuff in Marvel, and then all of a sudden, 1991, you're not writing Archie. Yeah. Yeah, so how did you get to write the red-headed team? I just, I was in the right place at the right time. I just, I was, I, I went on staff at Archie for a very brief time since 1991. This is before I did my stuff with Fiona. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, working sort of as a jack of all trades at that time, doing proofreading, doing, doing, you know, coloring work and so forth. Uh, Robert Moore Fleming actually hooked me up mm. with that because he the co-creator of Thriller and what was the Ambush Bug? Yeah, I'm the guess. Mm -hmm. Kind of co-creator Ambush Bug. Um, and he, he and I were good friends at the time, and so he did done some work up there. He got me an interview up at Archie, and I got to work with some really good people up there um, as a jack of all trades. I did a couple of stories there. Mm -hmm. Nothing you should seek out, but. <laughs> And everything was going well until until the day I left, and that was the day that it, 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 Archie Comics had been run by two older gentlemen who had inherited the company from their father. They were miserable people. <laughs> <laughs> they were horrible people <laughs> running the place. Everybody else was great underneath them, but uh, they were super competitive. They both had identical BMWs. They both had identical. Us. They both had identity. They, one couldn't have something, the other couldn't have. And they were just perpetually angry. And at one point, they were trying to, trying to expand Archie into a franchise of restaurants. And so they had run an advertisement for restaurateurs to interview with them and talk to them about it. And they ran it some sort of trade journal. And as a proofreader, I looked at it and I noticed they misspelled the word restaurateur. And I changed it. And ran. And then a few weeks later, one of them comes in screaming, like holding the magazine and waving it, who wants to know who changed the word, who got the word wrong, who made us look like an idiot. And I said, hello, <laughs> you know, and I'm still, I'm not being belligerent, I'm just, I'm kind of taken by the tidal wave of anger, and I said, it was me, and I, he said, well, how, why don't you, I said, well, it's in the dictionary. And he said, and I will never forget, well, the dictionary is wrong. <laughs> So, I didn't want the scene, I just went to my desk, I got my stuff, I went to my car, I drove home, and I never came back. <laughs> and yet, so he has his two years in DC, yeah. he has this, this brief stint at Archie. That's quite a list you got there. Oh, I, I took notes, yeah. I prepared, but um, I'm not going to do it all. Yeah. But I, I wanted to touch on the fact that 
throughout your career, you've gone freelance, you've gone staff, you've gone freelance, you, and you've been an entrepreneur since the Piranha interview. Yeah. So, you know, boom. Yeah. Boom brings you on as editor in chief, and you do some amazing work there that is, you know, still in print, which is very respectable in this field. What was the appeal of taking another staff job? Some of it was just that I knew Ross Ritchie and Andy Cosby, who created co created the company. I was friends with them. We were doing poker nights and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the, the challenge of it was something that I hadn't done that for a while. And not to jump ahead in your list, but I tried very hard to know as much as I can about every aspect of the business because I think it's an important thing to do as a collaborator because it just makes me better at working with other people. I know I taught myself enough about Photoshop and Illustrator to at least be able to color and letter, not on a real professional level, but that's not the point. You know, that way I know what my collaborators expect of me. And same with being an editor and same with being, you know, a publisher, so that you learn so much about the other people in the field and how to behave and how mm -hmm. all the pieces fit together. So what you know, what were some of the key takeaways from having been chief creative officer? Aren't as as I want them to be. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it, it, it was the ability to, you know, comics obviously had been very behind the curve in terms of bringing in people of color, mm -hmm. bringing in people of gender, mm -hmm. and that gave me a chance to bring in as many diverse voices, people who didn't look like me, which is what I worked with in DC Comics, that looked like me. Um, but bringing in more of those voices and that, and again, learning from that, paying attention and being mindful of the fact that just because they don't structure a story the way I, I would structure a story doesn't make it wrong. It just means they have a different point of view on how they approach the world. And one of the other stories you got involved in, and this one as a creator own thing, yeah. it was um, the very, very short-lived Gorilla Comics where you did Empire with Better Kids. Right. 